Hello, my name is Kuhn and I would like to welcome you to this course on Alpine.js. In this course I will talk you through the basics of Alpine.js, but first a couple words about the framework itself. Alpine.js is a pretty minimal JavaScript framework. I would say it's best used in cases where you just need a little bit of JavaScript for opening and closing modals or drop downs for example. So I would say it doesn't serve as a replacement for other popular JavaScript frameworks like Vue or React, but more as an alternative to jQuery. However, it does take somewhat of a different approach in the sense that you write most of its code in line with your HTML, as you see here in the code example on the Alpine homepage. In that way, it's somewhat similar to the CSS framework called Tailwind. Now, with that being said, let's dive in and copy over this snippet from the documentation. I am using Visual Studio Code as a text editor during this course, but you should be able to follow along with any other ed editor. Now here I create a new HTML file called index and I paste in the snippet. Now what this script tag does is pull in the latest version in the version 3 release of Alpine.js. But let's first see what our code looks like without this line. So for now I just comment it out. And in order to see what this document looks like, I need to view this file in my browser. And as you see, this is just an empty, empty file, empty page. But if I look in the element inspector in the body, the h1 tag is actually there. However, it's just empty. So let's now see what Alpine makes of this. So I will uncomment this line, save it and refresh this page. And as you now see, Alpine.js did set the inner text of the H1 element to the value we assigned to message in the xdata directive. Now if that worked, we are good to go. I will see you in the next video. During the previous video I mentioned that I was using Visual Studio Code. And even though it doesn't really matter for the course which editor you are using, there are two Visual Studio Code extensions which can make your life a bit easier. The first one being Alpine.js IntelliSense, which provides auto-completion for Alpine.js directives. And the second one being the Live Server extension which allows you to start a local development server which can automatically reload changes on the page you are editing. So once you have that installed, you can go to the comment palette and look for live server open with live server, which will start a local development server. So it will serve the page from your local IP address and if I have this open side by side and make a change to this file, save the file, you see that the changes are automatically shown on the page, which is uh, kind of sweet. See you in the next video. Let's dive into Alpine for real now. In Alpine, everything starts with the xdata directive. Alpine directives are these special HTML attributes starting with an X, such as xdata, xtext, and there are many more of them which we'll cover later on during this series. Now when Alpine is loaded, which we do with the script tag here, it looks through the HTML document for elements that contain this xdata directive. And within those elements, Alpine X out what you tell it to do such as you see here, where we use the message property to set the inner text of this h1 element. To illustrate what I mean, let's start by writing some code. 
So first I will clean up this line and add a div element with a button inside. Now functionally this button doesn't do anything yet, but we'll change that. First we add our data directive back. And again we will have a message property with the string value hello. Now let's alert this message out once we click the button. And we do so by using the xon directive. Now let's see what Alpine makes of this. And this looks alright. We get the message value alerted back to us. However, we can write this piece a little shorter. Alpine allows us to write at click instead of on click. But this is just a little shortcut. Functionally, it does the same as Exxon, but I think it reads quite nicely. So during the rest of the series, I will continue writing at click instead of Exxon. Now you can think of this piece of HTML as a Alpine component. So what I mean by that is that if you would were to copy out the button out of this div that defines x data, it doesn't work. Alpine doesn't know that it should bind this at click to an on click event. So in order to get that functionality back, you would need to define some x data. And even though it doesn't work yet, we now get an error that message is not defined. And this refers to this message variable. And this is something that is called scoping. All the data that is defined in a single Alpine component is local to that Alpine component. So we cannot use message outside of this X data. However, we can obviously define message here as well. So if we would were to click the second button now, we get the message hi and the first one still echoes out hello. From the third version of Alpine, it is now also perfectly legal to nest these data components inside each other. So we can move the button back inside the div. And what you would now see is that for this message variable, this property is used, while the second button doesn't have its own X data and therefore uses the one from its parent. So to confirm this, the first button says hi, the second one says hello. Now what is good to notice here is that setting the message on the first button doesn't change the value of the one from its parent since it is still visible to the second button. However, it does recreate it for its own scope. So this one has hi, this hello. And with that, we covered a whole lot of X data. I will see you in the next video. Let's talk about how we do data binding in Alpine. Now, this is something we did before to some degree by binding the message to the inner text of an H1 element using X text just like this. Now to make it a bit more visible what's going on here, let's have two buttons which will both update the value of message. So this one will set message to high and this one to buy. And as you will see now, once I click these buttons, Alpine makes sure for you that the message in H1 is re-rendered. So this doesn't just work with the inner text of HTML elements. We can just as well bind HTML attributes. So let's add a text input and bind the placeholder first to message. Now, as you will see now, is that we have a placeholder in this text input, which just prints the string message. 
Now, in order to bind the message property, we got to use the xbind directive. And once we click these buttons now, you'll see that the placeholder is just as well updated. Now, just like the xon directive, there is a shortcut for xbind as well, which I will use from now on, which is just a semicolon. Now, this is something that we call one-way data binding, which in some cases just is not sufficient enough. For example, if I would were to bind the input value instead of the input placeholder, this looks all right at first glance, but once we change the input value, Alpine doesn't seem to notice that it should update the H1, for example. For those use cases, we want something that is called two-way data binding. Meaning we don't just want Alpine to re-render the input once we change the message using a button. We also want to update the message using the input value as well. And therefore we are using something that is called xmodel instead of the value. And if I would change the input value now, we see that the X text in H1 is updated as well. And once we click the buttons, that still works as well. So that's great. I'll see you in the next video. In the last video, we started to use X model for two way data binding of input values. Now Alpine has the concept of modifiers which you can use in combination with the xmodel directive and some other directives. These modifiers allow you to make some small adjustments on how Alpine normally handles data or events. And to see what I mean by all of this, we will make a super basic calculator during this video. For the calculator, we will need two inputs. So we will remove the buttons and the H1 and instead of a message property in our data, we will have a first number and this will be an integer. So we remove the quotes as well and a second number. And I will set, set them both to zero for now. The first input we will bind to first and the second to second. And we will change the type to number instead of text to prevent the input of letters, for example. Now to output the sum of the both, we will use a span element and set x text to first plus second. So I'll add some of this to make it look a bit nicer. Let's now see what happens when we actually add some input in here. So I'll set the first number to 20 and the second one to seven, which gives us 207, which isn't right. So what happens here is that input values are interpreted as strings. So instead of summing this up, those strings are just concatenated together. Now in order to fix this, we might use those modifiers Alpine provides us. So in order to add a modifier, we can use a dot followed by number in this case. And for the second one as well. And if we would were to try our calculator now, we add 20 and seven, which gives us 27. And that seems all right. Now you can chain these modifiers together. So for example, there is one that's called lazy, which makes sure that our model is only updated once we are focusing out of our input. So if we are setting this one to 20 now, nothing happens still. We go to the second one at seven and I'll click outside this input to remove the focus from this input 
and again we're getting 27 so that's all right see you in the next video let's continue and discuss how we can toggle the visibility of elements using alpine now maybe this doesn't sound all that interesting but showing and hiding elements is actually something that makes up for a lot of the interactions you have on a website think of opening and closing modals or toggling a drop down so i will remove the contents of this div and of this data as well and add a show property which will determine whether we show the contents of a drop down so i will add a button to do so with an on click event listener and this add click will toggle the value of show so I will set show to its negated value. Now in order to actually have something happening, let's add a div which will serve as the container for the drop down contents. So here I will add a Alpine directive that we haven't seen before, X show, and I will have it watch the value of show. Now let's first add something to see whether this is actually working. So now we have a drop down and once we click it we toggle the value of show which determines whether this div is shown or not. And we can look in our element inspector actually and see what happens behind the scene. So I'll go to the body and here is the div which will toggle and as you see maybe the style is set to display none. So we are actually hiding the div with CSS behind the scenes. So what happens here is that show gets evaluated to either true or false and if it's true XShow makes sure that it is displayed on the page and when it's false XShow adds the display none CSS value and therefore it is hidden on the page. Now this doesn't only work with single values we can actually pass an entire expression to XShow. So let's say we have a page property in our XData which will determine which heading we will show on top of the page. So let's have one for home, settings and profile, and hide the ones accordingly. So we will add one for when page is an empty string, for when page is set to settings and one for when the value of page is profile. Now we are only showing home, but let's add some functionality to our drop down menu. So I will clear out this line and add a button with an on-click event listener which will set the page to an empty string which we are checking for for this heading and give the button the text home and I will do the same for settings and profile. So fill in these variables all right let's check out whether our drop down is working now now when I press settings we are showing settings profile home settings that looks all right uh, one thing that is a bit ugly if you ask me is that the drop down stays open when I switch the page. 
So in order to fix this, we can add a second action in here. Setting show to false, which we need to do for the other two buttons as well. So home, settings, profile. That looks good. One thing you might notice is that it somewhat flashes when the page is refreshed. But this is something we will get at in the next video. See you there. In the previous video we used the X show directive to mimic the behavior of a drop down. So once we would click this drop down, the show property from our data would be set from its default value false to true and X show would make sure that the contents of the drop down would be shown. And if we would click the drop down button again, the show property is toggled again to false, which would hide the buttons. Now, even though this works fine, it does come with a small problem. And you will notice this when I refresh the page. Very shortly, the buttons are shown below the drop down and then they are quickly hidden again. Now, this is due to the fact that the I initial web page is loaded but Alpine is not yet initialized and therefore this show doesn't happen yet. Now there is another directive which solves this problem and that one is called xcloak. So I will include this on el all the elements where we use xshow as well. So that is these four places. Now this doesn't work completely out of the box, unlike other Alpine directives. There's a small piece of CSS which is needed, and I will include that in the header. Now the CSS itself, and I'm gonna cheat here a bit, uh, can be copied from the Alpine documentation. I will paste that in, save the file again, and now when I reload the page, it seems fine and the drop down itself still works. So that's great. I will see you in the next video. In the previous video, we used Xcloak to get rid of this flickering effect. That was due to the fact that Alpine uses inline CSS to hide elements that should not be shown on the web page which Alpine determined by evaluating this expression that was passed to xshow. Now in this video we will look at an alternative that is called conditional rendering. And as this name suggests, with conditional rendering the HTML content is only rendered on your web page uh, if the condition evaluates to true, which is different from the xshow in the sense that xshow will always render the contents, only hide it with CSS. In order to make it all somewhat more simpler, I will remove this drop down functionality we are having, uh, such that we are not dealing with this show property. So we are just using the page variable in this example. So I will remove all of that, right, like this. So what we're having now is just three buttons at the top, which switch these three headers. Now there is an important detail that you should be aware of when you are using conditional rendering in Alpine which is that conditional rendering only works with one specific HTML tag called template, which is this one. Now the contents of template are normally not displayed on a web page. So if I would remove this line, the web page would be empty.
except for these buttons. Now this is what template was designed for. So the contents of template are meant to be only rendered using JavaScript. Now in order to do so with Alpine, we can use the xif directive, which works with an expression as well. So let's again check for an empty string, which is our default here and what we're setting page to when we click this button. And as you see, that seems to work fine. Now let's copy this one again twice for our profile page and our settings page. And remove these two and see if our menu now works and that looks fine and when I refresh the page we got rid of the flickering as well but now by using conditional rendering instead of X cloak. I will see you in the next video. Before we are ending this section there is still something that I would like to emphasize and that is that the value that we are passing to Alpine directives is nothing fancy, just plain JavaScript. So for example, this is just a regular JavaScript object. And therefore we can also use regular JavaScript functions. So instead we can refactor this piece a bit and just handle the same functionality with a single heading for which we set xText to page. So let us remove this and set the default to home and on this button click set the variable page to home as well. Now what I meant is that on this page variable we can just call JavaScript functions. So for example, we can call to uppercase, which will print home uppercase, or to get the same functionality we had before with just the first letter capitalized, we do dot char at and get the first character, which we will uppercase and do some string concatenation with the rest of the sling string. So we slice it from the first character. And with that we get the same functionality back but with a lot less code. Which is great. I will see you in the next section. Great! You made it to the second section. In this section we will work with dynamic data. First we just hard code it in our xdata property, but later on we will fetch some data from an external API and show it on our web page. Now in this video we will start with for loops. And in order to do so, I will make this an unordered list and remove all the contents inside. Now instead of a page in our data, we'll start with a user's property and an array that will contain just some strings. Now for loops allow us to re-render a template multiple times and we handled templates before in conditional rendering. By default they are not rendered on a page but with JavaScript we can show them and reuse them. Now in order to make a for loop we again need the template tag and the Alpine directive for for loops is x4 and in here we just have 
the JavaScript syntax for for loops, which will be user, and we can determine this name ourselves. And afterwards, make it in users. And for now, we will just use xText to use the string in our array as the inner text of the list item. So I'll save this and that should work. We now have a list with all the elements in the for loop. In the previous video, we started to use for loops to render just strings from an array. Now, this is nice, but you often want to do the same with objects. And we can just hard code them as well in here. So let's again shoot for three users and I will make them objects with a first name property. We'll have a James, a John, and a Jane. And in our list, we are getting now the user object from this for loop. So this will just print out the object representation, which is not what we are shooting for. Instead, we want to access the first name of the user object. So for our inner text, we're going to append user first name, which again will give us a list of usernames. There is a small but, however. In for loops, you often want to pass a key as well. Now, do keep attention to this colon. This colon was just a shortcut for xbind. Now, what this key is, is something that Alpine uses behind the scene to be able to smartly re-render the contents of the list once you resort or remove or add things to the list. Now, this key has to be a unique value per item in the list. So in this case, we could get away by using user first name as well. However, this would fall apart once there would be a second Jane, for example, which is quite realistically. So often you want to include something like an ID, for example. So I will add unique identifiers to the items in this list. And instead of binding the first name to the key of the for loop, use the ID we just created. Save it and it still works. Now in the next video, we will fetch similar data to this from an external API, which is going to be interesting. So I would love to see you there. Welcome back. In this video, we will do something pretty interesting. We will remove the hardcoded users and instead fetch them dynamically from this website. I guess this stands for request result, but they very conveniently have a user's endpoint, which contains a data key with users. And I don't need the second page, actually. Now let's start. First, we will empty our users because we are going to fetch them anyway. And we will do this in the x init directive. And x init is somewhat of a special directive in Alpine because it allows you to hook into Alpine's initialization process. 
So the code that you pass to Xinit will be executed before Alpine does any further HTML updates. So in here, let's set our users variable to the content we are fetching from this endpoint. And since that is a promise, obviously, I'll first make sure that the response we're getting back is going to be JSON, JSON data. And next, I am only interested in the data key from our result because that's the part that includes the users actually so let me switch back to this top check our network top actually to see whether we are fetching or not save this and that looks great actually so this is the data that comes in and we are printing their first names out to our screen. So that's great. See you in the next video. In the previous video, we set up all of this, the fetching of the users from an external endpoint, which works fine, but for me, it's a little too much inline code. So what we can do is create a separate script section in which we define a function, which I will call users list, since in the end, that's the thing we are printing on the screen. And our function needs to return an object. And remember, this is due to the fact that xdata always expects an object as well. So here I reference the function we just made and in our return statement I will define the users again as an empty array. Now we can mix functions and data together in here. So what I will do is create a function for this. So let me cut this piece out and create a function called fetch users and we will just return the fetch promise and give this some proper indent and let's instead call that function from here and if I'll save this now then our users are still there let me remove this line for a second to see that we actually need it in order to load the users and that seems all right thanks for watching great job you managed to get to the end of this course on Alpine JS I really hope you enjoyed this course and learned a lot about Alpine. I had great fun creating this course and would love to see what you have built. Now in order to stay up to date on Alpine, you can best keep an eye out on the Alpine website at alpinejs.dev. Now with that being said, I wish you all the best and I would like to welcome you in future courses. Thank you. Goodbye.